Uh, my name is Tony Chang. I'm a professor in the and welcome to our uh, seminar series jointly held between Forest and Range Land Stewardship and Ecosystem Science and Sustainability Departments. And it's my pleasure to introduce our today our speakers. We have Kainana Francisco, who is beaming in from Hawaii, um, and Christian Jardina. And both of them are with the Institute for Pacific Islands Forestry at the Pacific Southwest Research Station with the U.S. Forest Service. And without taking any more time, since we're all a little, already a little delayed, I'm just going to hand it over uh, to Francisco, uh, to uh, Kainana and Christian. All right. Well, <laughs> Aloha, everyone. Um, the Oli or chat that Christian and I just did, and apologies for Zoom folks if you heard like double audio. Um, but what we, uh, the chat that we just did speaks about Ohia, um, Metrosiders polymorpha. It's our, it's Hawaii's most abundant native tree, a beautiful biocultural keystone species in every sense of the word. And the chat that we just did was written by our dear friend, teacher, mentor, Kekuhi Kiali Ikonaka Ole Ohaili Leni. Um, it was written for her learners in the Hala Ohi'a Hawaii Stewardship Training Program. And in that program, we use this chant to request entrance into Hala, which is a place of Hawaiian learning. Um, and sometimes we use this chant for you know, other reasons, like uh, when we enter a forest or if we're gonna exchange, do an exchange with a community that we're visiting. Um, and so the intention of doing this chant with you folks here today is to acknowledge that uh, we're open, ready to exchange, uh, ready to engage and exchange with one another, um, and to create a space for open dialogue and sharing. And so, with that, kialoha aina yaka ho. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kainana Francisco, and um, coming from Hawaii, uh, beaming in from Hawaii, and then you guys have Christian with you folks in Colorado. Um, and like we were introduced, we work for the Forest Service here in Hilo, the Institute of Pacific Islands Forestry. And we just wanted to thank you folks uh, for giving us the opportunity today to come and share about some of our biocultural stewardship work in Hawaii. So Christian. Yeah, um, so as is common in Hawaii, we usually start with a series of acknowledgements and so you have a really beautiful land acknowledgement statement, a very powerful land acknowledgement statement here at CSU. And so we thought it was very appropriate to start with this land acknowledgement. Uh, it's intended to be read um, start to finish. So that's what I'm gonna do. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne and Ute nations and peoples this was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and affirmed. Colorado State University is founded as a land grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion and significantly that our founding came at the dire cost to native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education uh, and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. 
And I just wanted to say very briefly that these landing acknowledgements are important um, for us as uh, resource professionals who work on land. And um, we find it important in Hawaii uh, as a process of building um, communities, uh, allyship among um, uh, different uh, groups uh, to address historical injustice and the kind of um, actions that we want to see uh, take place following these acknowledgements. And so with that, we want to acknowledge our teachers who have helped in our growth and understanding as we move to do that here in Hawaii. Um, first and foremost, we want to mahalo the, we want to thank the nurturing mentorship of Kekuhi, who I mentioned earlier, who for 14 years has been transforming our place of work. Um, the word kumu can mean base, foundation, teacher, guide, origin, source, reason, goal, and so Kekuhi for us in the most holistic sense of the word um, is our kumu. You know, she, she is that foundation for us, our teacher and our mentor. Um, Christian and I are both part of Kekuhi's Halau Ohi a Hawaii Stewardship Training Program. And I'll be sharing a little more about the program, um, but essentially it's a unique professional development program anchored in indigenous Hawaii knowledge and life ways, um, Hawaii culture, Hawaii perspectives, and enhances the way that people connect with their environment and their communities, both human and more than human. Um, and part of, uh, you know, Hala Ohi'a is building sort of this community of, of, you know, people in conservation, people who are working on, you know, on land, uh, stewards and whatnot, and building that community who can grow together um, in these efforts. And so we want to, you know, mahalo and thank the many Kanaka OED colleagues outside of the Forest Service who have opened themselves up to being in partnership with us and have helped us to grow professionally and personally. And I want to make a note, it's not just the Kanaka OED colleagues, but I think it's also the allies that we're building in this movement. Um, folks who maybe have been, um, you know, born and raised in Hawaii, but not ethnically Native Hawaiian, um, folks who, you know, came for school or work and have been here a long time. Um, and then even folks who, you know, are recent, recent, um, recently moved to Hawaii, like everybody who's in Hala Ohi'a, we come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different generations, um, different histories, life histories. And so coming together to build this community, uh, has been um, amazing and we we just we want to acknowledge them and um, their contributions to these efforts um, and so Ke, uh, Kekuhi um, along with Dr. Topori Tangaro I'm going to go to the next slide Christian um, Dr. Topori Tangaro he's a director of Hawaiian culture and protocols engagement at the University of Hawaii at Hilo and Hawaii Community College he also happens to be Kekuhi's husband um, but through them and their family um, and through our Hala Ohi'a training, we've learned about this concept called Ka'au. Um, and so at its core, Ka'au are stories, myths, and legends. And through environmental observations, Ka'au were woven by ancestral wisdom to explain people's relationship to place. And in particular, they explain how to live in our spaces among our relations. Again, human and more than human. Ka ao, when you break up the word, it means to cause conscious awakening. And these stories, they tie us to place instilling responsibility that universally transcends time. And so it enhances our understanding of self and relationship to others. And each time we hear or retell a ka'au, that understanding expands. Um, and that provides uh, an opportunity for reflection on how we can improve ourselves and our surroundings. And so we're introducing Ka'au to you folks today or this framework of Ka'au because it's what we're gonna use to guide today's discussion and the things that we're gonna be sharing. Um, so specifically, uh, we're gonna look at what Tangaro calls the hero's journey, what he references as the hero's journey. And he describes it as being cyclical and made up of five stages or what he calls the five H's. So hua, starting at the top, uh, hua can mean egg, fruit, or seed. Uh, it's the catalyst and it's your why, you know, what sparks your journey. Um, Ha'alele means to leave or depart. Ha'alele is the launch and it's the separation or departure 
of what was and what's to become, what can become. Huaka'i means a journey, a mission, or to travel. So huaka'i here is the journey itself. It's the series of events and experiences in the journey that the hero faces um, and is ultimately transformed by that process. Ho'ina means to return or to go back. And so ho'ina here is the return. Um, it's the reintegration of that, that individual, that hero in the journey um, back into their life after the journey. Ha'ina means um, a declaration, statement, explanation, and in Hawaiian music, it's also the theme of a song. Um, and so at the ending of a song, they'll say things like, you know, ha'ina mai kapuana, like tell the refrain of the song. Um, what's that, like repeat the theme for us again, tell us what the song's about. And so ha'ina here is the reflection. It's the contemplating portion of the reason of the journey and the outcomes. You know, did, did you achieve what you wanted to achieve? Or have you realized things in your journey that you didn't, either you didn't know before or you're learning about yourself kind of a thing. And so we're using, we use this framework um, to study ka'al. So in our halauhi learning, we use it to study ka'al, you know, stories of place, um, where we're from, where we live, where we work, where we visit and so on. Um, ka'al helps us build pilina or relationship and understanding with places and people. And so we use the ka'al framework to help us build those connections through stories to places and people. Um, but we also use this Ka'al framework to sort of reflect and understand our own Ka'al, our own personal journeys, what's happening in our lives, where are we going, what are we, you know, what's our intention for being on this journey, whether it's realized or not yet realized. Um, and so today, again, we're gonna share about our individual and collective journeys through this Ka'al framework. Um, and it trying to, I guess, address um, this idea of cultivating biocultural stewardship by engaging history and embracing sacred, sacredness in our work. And so biocultural stewardship in Hawaii to me means knowing, understanding, and relating or connecting to each other's vai or sources. Vai means water, um, you know, vai vai meaning rich, like what is it that makes you your life or your uh, your surroundings wealthy in the terms of abundance. And so the relationship or pilina we build with our landscapes and each other in Hawaii way is how I bring uh, the sacred into what we do and where we do it. And so I share with you my personal ka'au, my personal story of who I am, where I come from. Um, and so when we look at the phrase or the question ova'i oi, um, you know, who are your waters? That's what it essentially translates to. Who are your waters? It's asking us, what's that source that nourishes us? You know, from whom do you come? Again, human and more than human. Um, and so for me, Ohana or my family, Aina or my land base, and Hula or our um, traditional Hawaii dance, those are the things that make Kainana. That's what, like, when I come into a room, that's who I bring with me every time. Um, and so how my family raised me, uh, the places um, and resources that sustained and nurtured and shaped me, uh, my training and life ways as a hula person, they not only guide how I live just my life in general, but I, I can't separate who I am uh, with what I do as a profession. And so that also that comes with me into the work that I do. Right, and sort of explains um, why I do things the way I do and why I do them in that particular way. And so, um, when so getting into my uh, my ka'a, right, my personal journey, and uh, using this hua ha'alele, hua ka'i, ho'ina ha'ina framework, um, I guess I'm gonna preface that I'm gonna share like. Um, my personal journey, um, it's a very simplistic journey. Uh, it's, um, I guess, sort of like for me, surface level, kind of starting to understand uh, where I am, how did I get here and where I'm going. And then when I got asked to sort of consider this idea of like, you know, nurturing biocultural um, stewardship, um, 
I sort of, I never really had thought about it up until I was asked these kinds of questions. Um, I never really thought about it. And so sort of you're, me, me sharing my ka'au is sort of my, my processing of um, what is my contribution to biocultural stewardship in Hawaii. Um, and so when I began my career at the Forest Service about 10 years ago, um, I didn't sit out consciously intending to cultivate biocultural stewardship. Like, uh, I, I guess that kind of thinking and um, phrasing is not in my vocabulary or my uh, understanding. I just, I do what I know how to do. Um, and, you know, I do what I was trained to do. Um, so coming from a hula background and whatnot, like that's just sort of how um, I grew up. And so, um, you know, um, I guess kind of using the Ka'au framework to reflect on this journey um, and, and my, my involvement in conservation and biocultural stewardship, um, I really, I guess I have to owe it to working with Kekuhi and helping her build the Halo Ohia program. Um, I feel like that's like at the core of my journey. And so when I start and I look at my hua, you know, what is that catalyst? You know, the why, what sparked that journey? I think as I was going through, as, as we were building the program, I didn't really like think about like, okay, I'm gonna help build this program because I want to do X, Y, and Z. It was sort of just like uh, kuleana or responsibilities um, came up that I stepped into. And again, that comes from my rearing, my training, right? Um, so reflecting back on it, what is that hua for me? What was that catalyst for me? Um, I think this started when I was actually still in school. So I attended University of Hawaii at Hilo and Hawaii Community College for my undergraduate and graduate studies. And, you know, I had a very strong support system. There was a Native Hawaiian, Kipuka Native Hawaiian Student Center and the Iola Haloa Center for Hawaii Lifestyles. I had many mentors and advisors who are Native Hawaiian or are uh, trained in Native Hawaiian ways of understanding. And that included folks like Kekuhi and Tangaro. And so, they ensured that I was provided the opportunities and experiences to fulfill my potential, to succeed academically. Um, you know, I was part of this village um, and not, and I guess as a student, it wasn't just like take care of my responsibilities of, you know, being a student at UH or HCC and, you know, getting good grades and whatnot being part of that village they also sort of like ingrain in you um the some, bigger picture things without straight up telling you and so i was exposed to a lot of ideas um conversations and efforts to indigenize the university system and i wanted to read a couple of excerpts from the university's website um that addresses that moment uh, that movement it's called hawaii papo keao because i think it really it parallels uh what happened when I got into the Forest Service, it, it put me into similar environments. And so um, coming from a place like um, the UH system that's trying to do these efforts or with that particular village that was trying to push these efforts, I sort of just, it was easy for me to translate that to uh, the Forest Service who was asked, starting to ask similar questions um, of me. At least I was start being, starting, I was uh, being pulled into conversations that were being, um, addressing the same issues. And so uh, in January 2012, Hawaii Papokeao set goals and objectives to address the higher education needs of our indigenous people, Native ones, by creating a model indigenous serving institution. There are powerful motivations for Univers University of Hawaii to be supportive of its indigenous population. Some of its campuses sit on ceded lands. Ne uh, negative Native Hawaiian social and economic statistics exist and inequity of success among its native and non-native students are factors that demand attention. While there are many reasons to be concerned about native Hawaiian college success, the working committee believes the most important reason to address this issue is because it is pono, the right thing to do. And so being around strong native Hawaiian advocates and allies during those early um, you know, academic professional development years, um, it was sort of just ingrained in me that like, this is just, we just, this is how we do things. Um, this is what's expected of our students. Um, and so we were always, you know, asked and 
ask to reflect on the idea of like, what's your function in our community? How are you going to use the knowledge and skills from school or from your hula training to uplift and grow ourselves and those around us? Um, and so when I graduated, you know, um, I feel like that was my ha'alele, that was that departure point, that was the launch into my journey. You know, I came, I, I had this comfortable, safe, nurturing nest space with, you know, so many mentors and advisors. And then I joined the Forest Service in my first real job outside of like student internships and positions. And so I was sort of just like, okay, you're off, go, go on your journey now, kind of a thing, find your place in, in the community, in the world. Um, and so, you know, um, I feel like my huaka'i, my journey so far, like I'm in that third stage right now, already talking about that huaka'i. It's definitely been about trying to find that village again, because I'm very much like a village type of person. I like having my, my people around me and, you know, uh, just being with them, working with them, um, and, you know, sort of being in conversations with like-minded people, like that's what brings me comfort and strength. Um, and so for very personal reasons, um, you know, as I'm going through this huaka'i, um, I guess finding that village uh, was sort of, I, I wouldn't, I guess I could call it selfish. There were selfish reasons. Like I wanted to have that village, that feeling again, right? And so uh, what were the opportunities that I could uh, participate in or help um, to support me being able to find that village again? And I knew that others would benefit from having sort of that support system as well. Um, and so it wasn't completely selfish. Like I knew it would help others, but it was a it was a personal drive for me to sort of find that and so a few years into my career um i was part of a conversation that basically asked like what can we do at the forest service what can we do to help our science and research just do better how can not in terms of like um how do we make the science better but how do we how do we make our connection to community um when it comes to our science and our research how can that be improved um, and the first thoughts that came to my head were, let's go get that village um, and let's anchor it in uh, Hawaii ways of knowing, because that's what I know. Like, that's like, I can help with that. And so Kekuhi had already been working with the conservation community for several years doing this kind of work. Um, but it, at that time, I think it was um, occasional cultural workshops and meetings and like, you know, uh, I think she wanted to she wanted to do more than that. She wanted um, people to invest time, energy um, in sort of the the traditional school sense and the traditional Hawaii school sense. She wanted to open a halau essentially, um, that traditional school, and she wanted it to be where stewards of the Hawaii landscape could come, learn Hawaii life ways, cultural skills, and have that not only enhance the way they engage with their communities, um, but more importantly, uh, be able to apply those skills to their personal lives and uh, stewardship professions for transformation. And so long story short, I helped get some funding. We connected with Kekuhi uh, to help her like uh, actualize her dreams of opening this Halau Ohi'a um, school. Um, and then we were able to do that uh, starting in 2016. And so through Halau Ohi'a, Learners are provided with opportunities to learn and develop skills in things like Hawaii language, story, chant, song, dance, ritual and protocol, spirituality, family life, environmental kinship, uh, Hawaiian cosmology. And like we do a lot, a lot more, like so much more that we learn uh, different times, types of experiences. Um, but it's providing that opportunity um, for professionals to engage because uh, if other than hala uhi'a, I feel like the only ways you can really engage in this kind of learning um, is if you go to other types of hala, other types of school schools. So like for me, I'm in hala hula. I go to a traditional dance school. Christian's in hala va'a. You know, his his passion is like the ocean. So uh, sailing and voyaging and paddling. Um, there are places where you can go to sort of get those experiences to help uh, establish those connections um, to place through um, sort of uh, Hawaii practices. 
um, what halal wahi is. I mean, I guess you could also do it through like university and those traditional types of schools. But um, halal wahi is sort of, um, I think it it gives you like all of those types of experiences and like it's designed to be um, rooted and anchored in in aina in land and in stewardship and in conservation and environmental kinship and so hello ohia for this particular community i think has been really um it's been very powerful it's been a very powerful movement uh for for folks like christian and i working in an agency you know in hawaii in an indigenous place um but from but our work is done through you know um as a federal agency and so how can we do that how can we do our work uh with i guess more more understanding more honor um and embracing where we are um and 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 who and the land that we and the land and the people uh, that we you know work with the indigenous people that we work with and so um i just wanted to share that since 2016 halal we has worked with well over 600 stewards um 80 of whom, including Christian and I, who have been training for three to six years, 45 of them have been training for two years. Um, and when you look at traditional schools, that's like short. That's like a sh like traditional Hawaii schools are like lifetime investments. Um, and that's, I think, what Kekuhi was asking of the conservation community, that we needed to invest more than, you know, a Friday workshop once a year kind of the thing. She wanted us to invest ourselves, our spirits, um, and you know, and and be able to bring that back to our workplace. And so um just real quickly, my hoina, my haina, my return and my reflection. I feel like I'm still on that huakai, I'm still on that journey. And so I feel like I also there's times where maybe I do sort of reintegrate back into you know, what I'm learning through Halau Uhia, bringing it back to my workplace, bringing it back to our projects and things. I contemplate about, okay, what is this journey? You know, what's the outcome? Like, am I doing what I set out to do kind of a thing? I feel like that's like a recent thing for me, um, this this re return and reflection piece. Um, you know, Kekui's intentions of opening the school was so that we could take things back to our communities and our professions in real time and transform our places of work. And she always talks about how, um, you know, like transformation can't wait for you to be done with your learning, with your training. You need to be transforming as you're learning. And so uh, that's, I think, something I've I've recently come to like, I've always understood it, but what I've come to actually internalize um, that I, I at, you know, at some point I have to begin to start uh, working with the communities that I'm a, a part of, which is for me in work, it's it's IPIF, our our institute, it's our 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 team, Christian and I's team, um, uh, it's the Forest Service, all of those things. And so, thinking ahead, right, um, in my next five, 10, 20 years of my career, uh, what is it that I'm gonna do? Like, um, how am I gonna spend that time? How am I gonna invest in um, taking my learning and bringing it back to transform our work of place. Um, and so one thing I also realized too is I'm a very, by nature, I'm a very detail-oriented person. Uh, I'm, it's easy for me to look internally and in my, my personal space. Um, and what I appreciate about working with Christian is he's a, he's a big picture kind of person. He can see, he can see how things like what we do, how it impacts and affects um, bigger things, right? Bigger than our team, bigger than our institute. He can see how things can um, impact and transform the forest service types of things. And so for me, um, that's that's the kinds of things that I, I feel like I'm gonna be considering uh, in my ho'ina ha'ina and the rest of my huaka'i. Um, and what Christian is gonna share is sort of um, the, I think he's gonna start off with his personal ka'au, right? His personal journey, but then his personal journey transforms into this collective journey that I am also a part of, that I'm starting to realize, oh yeah, I, I help you with that kind of things. Or like, yeah, that's, that. okay, so that's what we're doing. 
Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm excited to kind of have Christian share with you folks what it is, um, his journey, and then also what it is that we're sort of doing at the Forest Service. Um, so with that, uh, I'll pass it to Christian. Mahalo, Kainana. Um, so um, one of the things that Kainana didn't touch on is that one of the reasons why we spend time talking about Ka'au, why we talk about um, this journey, is that so much of conservation does not involve the relationship pieces that uh, make up most families and social uh, communities. And we're very much interested in breaking down walls, especially with community. And so part of that for us is bringing to the table a much bigger piece of who we are. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit about who I am and my Ka'au. Um, my journey started in the Mediterranean, um, acknowledging my family. Uh, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side was born in Torino. On my dad's on my um, sorry, on my mother's side and my dad's side in Sicily. My grandmothers were born in Benghazi. They had uh, children in Benghazi um, when my grandparents, my grandfathers moved to Libya. Uh, during World War II, uh, both sides of the family fled as refugees to Italy. And um, uh, they decided at some point that they wanted to move to the US. And so my story is an immigrant story. They came to the US, settled in New York, had three kids. Um, I was the oldest. I went to college, studied biochemistry and political science. Um, I was drawn to refugee stories, poverty, justice kind of questions. And after college, I um, engaged in topics of homelessness and poverty in Denver, Colorado. I became part of a faith-based um, justice community. I uh, became very involved in justice issues and organizing for justice causes. There was a program at Iliff School of Theology that I uh, started and became a master student at Iliff School of Theology where I met uh, Glenn Morris and um, George Tinker. They're both uh, Native American scholars uh, that, that taught at Iliff and at the International School of Studies at, at University of Denver. And um, that was my ha'alele into um, justice studies and um, understanding indigenous history of our country. Um, I graduated in the spring of 1992, um, spent the summer up in the mountains guiding, and uh, came to this campus in the fall of 1992 um, to study with Dan Binkley, who's right here in front of us. And I wanted to understand um, stewardship. I wanted to understand how management could support communities. And so I um, took classes, uh, took on biogeochemistry, took on forest ecology management, and I also took uh, conservation classes. I um, learned about sort of Western conservation. I learned about John Muir. I learned about wilderness and wilderness ethics. I um, was impressed with the kind of the spirituality of uh, John Muir's writings. I was also impressed that a lot of John Muir's writings sort of erased um, indigenous people that I had spent two years studying. Um, I wanted to learn about conservation's progression. And in nine, uh, 2014, uh, Georgina Mace wrote a really nice synthesis of conservation's progression. She described it as moving from nature for itself. Basically, let's study these beautiful wild places. Um, then it moved into this period of nature despite people. This is kind of when I entered into, into grad school was in this period where conservationists were at war trying to protect um, these, these fenced or, or um, legally protected areas. Um, this moved into this period of um, ecosystem services, ecosystem function. So how does nature serve people as a way to um, understand uh, the, the, the positive impacts that conservation might have on, on society? And then this um, last stage that we're in now, apparently, I don't know what the next stage is going to be, but um, it's people and nature. And this is that socioecological stage of understanding nature and conservation. So thinking about these things, um, uh, after my ha'alele at Iliff School of Theology, I, I thought 
um, very simple questions like, is this framework accurate? This is a depiction of North America and the ancestral homelands of um, countless uh, um, peoples, uh, communities um, across North America who have been stewarding these places for thousands of years. So in a very simple uh, analysis of the situation, maybe 1960 wasn't the start of conservation. Um, we also know that there was uh, a fair bit of military activity and expansion of the United States uh, from the 13 original colonies across the West and into Hawaii. And so I did spend some time trying to understand uh, a little bit about the foundations of Western conservation and how we got to the point where there was so little information about indigenous people that occupied um, so much of this continent and um, why it is that Western conservation was so fascinated with this wilderness ethic. Um, many of us in Western conservation are taught about our these founding members of conservation on the right, uh, Madison Grant, who was instrumental in setting up the park service system. On the left, Gifford Pinchot, the founder of my agency. In the middle, um, John Muir, who is considered to be one of the founders of, of the, the idea of conservation. And so these people have really illustrious resumes, just tremendous resumes, but they also had um, really uh, a dark side to them. Uh, Madison Grant was uh, strongly racist and anti-Semitic. His writings um, actually inspired uh, the Holocaust. Um, uh, Gifford Pinchot was a representative of um, uh, the US government to eugenic societies in the early days. Um, their writings uh, collectively um, certainly uh, supported, um, potentially fostered um, white supremacist ideas in this country that um, continued today. And so um, one of the things that um, strikes uh, us in, in the Forest Service in Hawaii, and certainly has been something that I've been occupied with, is how do these roots that are so ingrained in um, either racism or erasure, how do these roots affect what we do today and how we do those things? Um, I want to definitely emphasize that the goal here is not to disparage um, the huge number of conservationists who are doing amazing work in the field. Um, just uh, top-notch people who are working every day to find, you know, save species, um, save uh, ecosystems, uh, keep endangered species from going extinct. Um, our goal is basically to address something that we think has been an obstacle in Hawaii to being more effective as a conservation community. This um, kind of colonial conservation story made its way to Hawaii. Uh, Lauren Thurston, uh, he's uh, revered in Hawaii as the founder of our two biggest national parks, Haleakala and um, Volcanoes National Park. Um, Lauren Thurston was also politically very active. He was the architect for the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. This is Queen Lilio Kalani, um, the last uh, reigning monarch in Hawaii. Um, he was politically very active uh, he worked for years before the overthrow to push for military annexation of Hawaii. He um, led the coup that overthrew um, Queen Lilio Kalani. He established a provisional government, and then he worked uh, very hard to create legislation that specifically legitimized the theft of land from Native Hawaiians and their um, disenfranchisement. So the theft was so egregious that in 1993, um, the U.S. government uh, passed a law, uh, it was signed into law by Bill Clinton, um, it was called the Apology Resolution. And basically the Apology Resolution uh, says that following the 1893 overthrow of the Hawaiian uh, nation, um, 1.8 million acres of, of Kanaka Uvi lands, nearly half of Hawaii's land base, um, became ceded to the U.S. provisional government. And then that became the Republic of Hawaii and then eventually the state of Hawaii. And this was done without the consent or compensation to Kanaka Oivi or their sovereign government. Um, this, uh, this is really significant for conservation because mo almost all of our conservation lands in Hawaii are um, derived from this ceded land estate. Our natural area reserves, our forest reserves, um, the national parks, county and uh, city green spaces. 
And so we operate um, as conservationists, uh, primarily on this ceded land base. And like um, many uh, uh, land grant institutions, um, our uh, university system is largely based on, um, on this ceded lands estate. So revisiting this, um, this vision for conservation's progress, um, conservation's inconvenient truth, it really is a very small sliv sliver of a colonial period that followed a, a period of conquest, that followed a very long period of indigenous stewardship. And one of the things that is, I think, striking about the progression is that we may be moving into a, a period of recovery from multiple angles. And so what we like to think in Hawaii is that this next stage is actually recovery from colonialism. It's not just a movement towards socio-ecological systems in some uh, benign progression. It's recovery from uh, what are, uh, as your land acknowledgement stated, di uh, events that had dire consequences for indigenous people. And so just to summarize real quick, our landscapes and seascapes are not what they seem. Uh, the expropriation of land uh, from indigenous people continues around the world. Um, uh, there's still many unresolved issues with regards to land tenure and water rights. Um, a lot of these uh, are still um, being imposed because of colonial systems that manage these resources. And just want to highlight that I, I feel like in my time in, in Hawaii that we're all affected by these legacies, um, psychologically, spiritually, um, and their social costs that um, influence our ability to move forward as a community of people who care about place. Um, this idea has been captured and uh, folks have really started running with it. Um, it it's uh, captured in this, in this idea, i ka olelo no ke ola, i ka olelo no ka make, uh, words can heal, words can destroy. And um, Mackenzie and Sprout, who are uh, lawyers um, in, in uh, the University of Hawaii School of Law, um, they have uh, taken this very powerful olelo noyao or why saying and they've um, brought it into the framing of injustice and that it's about social memory constructing an accurate and compelling collective memory and using this reframed collective memory to achieve um, reparative actions for indigenous people and um, this has many practical reasons as well as it being the right thing to do um, one of the things that Gavin says, uh, Gavin and I'll say in, a, in an eloquent way, is that when conservation planning ignores sociopolitical context, success really rarely ensues. And this is this idea that conservation biology isn't this independent, um, objective science. It's informed by values, and those values are informed by history. And so how do we bring in another side of history um, with a different set of values to shape our conservation ethic going forward. In this case, um, in Hawaii, uh, this Hawaiian history of ceded lands. Um, there's another, I think, more um, kind of meta reason for why this is really important. This is a, a question by a science writer, Anna Kofar, um, to um, Bruno Latour's Postmodern Philosophy. And she asked if scientific knowledge is socially produced and thus partial, fallible, and contingent, how do, how do, how do we not um, weaken uh, the claims that we have on reality? And her concern is that Latour's um, uh, philosophy and view of how science is produced could, could undermine our ability to do our work. Um, the key point being that uh, Latour is suggesting that science um, does produce facts, but the way those facts become uh, uh, introduced to the public, becomes part of our discourse, is that they are networked socially. And the strength of the network um, affects the, the, the way that the ideas are presented and the, and the robustness with which those ideas are shared and compete with alternative explanations. Latour responded, um, facts remain robust when they are supported by a common culture and institutions can be trusted and a decent public life and reliable media. Um, so when facts uh, are shared in common and we have a common collective memory, um, that's uh, a path to uh, addressing um, Kofur's uh, concerns. But when we're not dealing with 
the, the facts of our origins or the facts of our landscapes, then are we um, risking credibility issues? Are we risking the ability to uh, speak with confidence about the landscapes that we're stewarding? Um, some of the progression that we've been trying to go through at the Institute is moving from this sort of traditional model of resource stewardship, where you have a resource, you have Western knowledge, you have professional practitioners, and then you have leaders and decision makers who um, basically shape decisions. Um, there's an idea, ikava ma mua, ikava ma hope in Hawaiian, which is to move forward, you gotta look back. And so it's important for us to look back to this, um, this model. It uh, looked at resources as commodities. Um, it looked at communities as um, basically uh, adversaries. And I'm really happy to say that in the last 20 years, I feel like in Hawaii, a lot of agencies have moved beyond that model. We now, um, after reflecting on the past, um, we're trying to redefine our futures. And a lot of what um, I think uh, Kainana was able to capture was that um, we have realized that we need to be much more engaged with communities and community practitioners and different knowledge systems in order to shape the kind of work that we do. We use now Western and shared indigenous and local knowledge. And together with communities, we're in a better place to shape resource stewardship. Um, we need to do more though. We need to think about our knowledge system uh, integration and how we do that. Um, many of us still think that there's really only one knowledge system. Um, and when we do think of multiple knowledge systems, we tend to caricaturize the other. Um, so it's Western science often against uh, Hawaiian culture. We don't typically acknowledge that um, the Hawaiian knowledge system does have culture, practices, values, norms, beliefs, but it also has science. And conversely, we don't acknowledge our own Western science as having um, practices, but then those practices um, are uh, based in values, norms, beliefs, and culture. And that shapes not so much uh, the, um, the specific actions that we might do in a lab and hold up a science, but the whole structure of why we're doing the work that we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, we don't do enough to embrace holism. Um, so uh, people don't think about the world just scientifically. Most people think about it from cultural, spiritual, environmental, and psychological perspectives. And we would do better, I think, in Hawaii if we as agencies could embrace a more holistic approach. Um, we also tend to get hung up on sort of this uh, bimodal way of looking at uh, conservation that either you're doing conservation because you believe things have intrinsic value or they have instrumental value. And a really important growth area for us is understanding that um, in conservation, there are also relational values. And Chan did a really nice job of highlighting how many of us care about conservation because we, are ha we have a relationship with the things that we care for, that we steward. And that becomes things that we care for, things that we love. Um, I uh, was just gonna touch real briefly on Halao Hia, but we're, we're definitely running um, towards the end of the session. So, Kainana really explained Halau he in a lot of detail. So I'm gonna um, move to sort of the end of the talk, which is how do we start thinking about decolonizing conservation and move not just to integrating multiple knowledge systems in our place. And so discussions of decolonizing conservation have, have focused on kind of two arenas. One, decolonization as metaphor and decolonization as repatriation of indigenous places. Um, decolonization as metaphor has complications. Um, Tuck and Yang have shared their concerns about um, uh, decolonization as metaphor. And she covers a number of really important um, guardrail topics, settler nativism, settler adoption, colonial equivocation, um, decolonizing your mind, um, asterisk people, reoccupation, and um, reconciliation. And so um, there are things that we need to think about as uh, settler colonists in Hawaii when we think about decolonizing. Um, we are seeking to create opportunities for relationship building with uh, between Kanako Iwi and policy and governance practitioners uh, and agencies. Um, so decolonization as repatriation of indigenous places um, has a number of, of elements that we can bring to the table. 
um, we can engage Kanako Iwi as self-determining nations rather than one of many stakeholders. We can identify and engage with existing uh, intended environmental governance processes and assertions of self-determination. We can choose venues and processes uh, that reflect Kanako Iwi rather than Eurocentric values and approaches. We can provide resources to Kanako Iwi communities to improve their capacity for collaboration and policy reform and decision making. And we can support Kanako Iwi communities in their own uh, continued environmental decision making and self determination. Um, we uh, are starting to think about a new concentric stewardship um, of place model where agencies and leaders serve as part of a, a team that support community leaders and uh, indigenous local knowledge practitioners. We work on decolonized Western and shared indigenous and local knowledge to steward our resources. Um, we're finding, and this is an, uh, um, uh, a surprise to our Kanako Iwi colleagues, but as agency people, um, uh, we're treading new areas uh, that concentric stewardship of place is place-based, multi-generational, multidisciplinary, integrated, technical, sophisticated, and adaptive. These are many of the things that we hope for our own practices. Um, these come up all the time. And these um, concentric stewardship of place models integrate these different things um, by the nature of being holistic and being from an indigenous perspective. And I just wanna end with uh, a couple of phrases that really have meant a lot to me personally as we move into um, uh, this next concentric stewardship of place model for the work that we do. He Pelina Vehena Ole, which means um, uh, an inseverable relationship. And so many agency approaches is, I work here for five years, I move to the other coast, I work five years there, I accumulate my professional credentials so I can get that GS-15, work in the Washington office, and then retire. Um, that is a very non-Indigenous perspective. And this idea of Hepilina um, Vehina Ole is that you have a connection to a place and that connection is inse inseverable. It's inseverable in terms of career ambitions, but it's also inseverable in terms of um, the, the conquests that happened in Hawaii and the expropriation of land from Hawaiian people. And so we, you may not have access to that land, um, but you are connected to that land uh, for your lifetime. And so um, when we talk about rebuilding these things, we, relationships, we need to acknowledge this and embrace this hippelina vehena ole idea. Um, we also need to do a better job of embracing the Hana Kui Ke Aloha, which translated literally means deeds done with love. So one of the things that in reflecting in how we engage community or how we held meetings, we very often would organize a group of people. We sort of did introductions and um, we would launch forward into statistics or management plans and the people who we're working with didn't understand our connection to the resources, resources that they loved and cared about. And so we were not connecting with our communities. And part of the reason is we were not expressing why we were doing what we were doing and whether what we were doing was based in love. Finally, um, something that's important to me personally as, uh, as someone who's not from Hawaii is this idea of keiki hanai and makua hanai, which is how do you become of place? Um, what is that process? Is this exclusive realm of indigenous people or are we in a place um, as stewards of uh, a parcel of land? If we want to take on an alternative model for stewardship, are we in a place where we can um, be connected long term to these places of importance to us? Um, so with that, I want to turn it back to Kainana and she's going to close us um, today with uh, an Oli. And um, I think, Kainana, you want me to switch over the screen to you. Is that right? Uh, no, that's fine. We can just look at this chat because I kind of want folks to uh, look at this word. So yeah, um, we just we we share one more chant with you folks today. Uh, it's called Kukuru Kapahu Kapuakaleo. It comes from uh, the the Ka'au of Pele and Hi'iaka. Uh, they're two sisters in Hawaii. Um, that are attributed to um, the volcanic landscape and the regeneration of our forests. Um, and 
the um, the the interpretation we share here is uh, from Tangaro Topori, Dr. Topori Tangaro's book, Lele Kawa. Um, and so just kind of going through this all so kukulu kapahu kapwa kaleo, you know, lash the drum whose voice is sacred. Um, he ala hele, he ala muku, no kane lawa kanaloa. For the winter solstice has arrived, the sun path of kane and kanaloa truncated by the longest night. He ki ho i ho i kanavai, a restoration is at hand. Ki ho i ho i being the law of restoration. He kayo kia kanavai, uh, life will be sustained. Uh, kayo kia being the law that identifies the boundaries between the ocean and the land. And so if those boundaries weren't there, the ocean would swallow up the land and there wouldn't be life. And so here, um, that law um, stating that life will be sustained, that those boundaries will be maintained. He kua'a kanawai. Kua'a, uh, for the land's back is alive with fire. And kua'a being the law of the flame back. And uh, in traditional times when we had um, ali'i or our monarchy system, our chiefdom, um, you would never approach a chief uh, and ali'i from behind. Uh, otherwise, it, uh, it was penalty upon death. Uh, so um, I guess recognizing and honoring and abiding by those laws that things uh, in nature, right? These are all secret nature laws. No pele no kua kua la, a reality owed to living on sacred lava. And so um, these kana vai, these, these rules of land, of the land of living here in Hawaii, uh, when we follow these, um, you know, these sacred environmental laws, um, there, there's a balance in our communities, in our environment. Um, and, and by returning or sort of honoring these, these ideas um, and, and bringing the sacred back into the work that we do, um, you know, lashing that drum whose waste is sacred, uh, that will just help us, um, you know, just further our, our efforts. And so, uh, Kukulu kapahu kapua kaleo Yala hele yala muku no kade lawa kanaloa He ki hoi hoi kanawai He kai o kia kanawai He kua kanawai No pele no kua kua la And so with that, uh, we, may you be inspired to lash the sacred drum of your own ka'au in your places um, and if your own story. Mahalo. So that is our journey. I know it's past time, but uh, I'm happy to stay if anyone wants to ask questions. Am I am I on the okay? So uh, I know you know folks have to go, but if uh, uh, people have questions, um, we can we can start. I I know this was for me was like hua. Uh, it's a start. It's a catalyst for me. Dan. If we looked around the United States or any other country, we might find that the people with lots of money have a very different view of their culture and their land and how the world comes to be the way it is to serve them. And if we looked at the working class people who are much more disadvantaged, their view of the world would not map very much onto that of the elite. How unified has Hawaiian tradition been over the development of the culture versus bifurcated by social classes. Can I just your share as well so you show up on this better? Sure. Um, and slideshow. And then I'll just highlight oh, here. Look at that, I can see. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a hugely complicated question. Um, I mean, Polynesian societies are stratified. Contemporary societies are stratified. There's mingling and stratification. Um, uh, I'm not able to speak to the Hawaiian side. Um, I know that... Um, you know, my experience with Halauhia and other conversations with people from all classes that 
it's a very powerful indigenous ethic that gets shared and Kainana might be able to speak to that. Um, I do think that urban Honolulu um, has a very different feel and a different set of relationships with Aina um, than maybe you find on Hawaii Island. But there's just a really um, strong movement for Aina based land based um, connection and I've been super impressed with um, uh, Honolulu efforts to bring uh, citizens across social um, uh, backgrounds, class to be connected with place. I don't know how unusual it is um, in the big picture, um, but if there's a, a place where you can you can work across class boundaries um, to bring an ethic of uh, concentric stewardship. I feel like Hawaii might be a, a place where you can do that. I'm guessing if you're you know living on Fifth Avenue in New York City, um, that bridge uh, is going to be a lot longer and a lot shakier to rural upstate New York. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but. Um, we're a, a much smaller community in Hawaii and um, just really impressed with um, how people from all different backgrounds, including class, come together to support um, uh, these justice oriented um, efforts. So, Kainan, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, I guess I, I, my, my, my comment on that would be Yes, there is, um, I guess, social, financial disparities uh, in, in indigenous Hawaii communities. Um, and so at least from my experiences and um, the opportunities I was provided, um, I guess that's, that, that is the, the key factor of ensuring um, that indigenous Hawaiian people are supported is that regardless of social or economic status that we provide opportunities um, for Native Hawaiians to um, better themselves, improve their families, improve their lives, uh, improve their communities. And that I think um, that is a, continue, a continual uh, challenge is making sure that that happens um, in the education sector, um, in economic development sector, in the conservation, natural resources sector. And so I guess in all, in all parts of society, um, how, like, I guess, what are Hawaiian people doing to uh, improve their lives, improve their stations? And what, uh, I guess, from an agency standpoint, what are we doing to help support that? Um, yeah, how are, how are we making it easier for Native people, Native Hawaiian people to access um, these opportunities to better themselves. Um, and for me, I've been lucky that, um, you know, I, I come from a, a household that didn't have money growing up. And so uh, being blessed to have all these opportunities to go to school, um, you know, become educated, um, have the opportunity to participate in internships and, you know, paid internships that helped me, you know, develop my resume and my career and get those experiences needed to be, um, I guess, uh, competitive in the in the workforce training, right? In the workforce in conservation in Hawaii, um, I guess that's that's yeah, that's a challenge. It's it's I think it's always going to be a challenge, but I think in thinking of how the Forest Service contributes to finding solutions, um, that I, I'm I'm excited about that, and yeah, I hope that answered the question. Probably like 30 years ago, I back then, and I might have misunderstood your question now, but I'll have to live with it like I have for 30 years. Uh, Hello, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Um, I wanted to introduce myself in my native language since you all off, since you offered that also on your end. Um, and so I, my name is Ariel. I'm from Cochiti Pueblo, which is one of the tribes in New Mexico. Um, my my question is, I 
I feel like I'm really, I'm really excited to hear that there are, you know, people who are big partners in land management, like U.S. Forest Service, who are willing to engage in, who are willing to try new things that are out of their comfort zone. Um, and they're willing to trust in indigenous peoples that we we know what we're talking about that we know how to manage the land and that it's not even managed that we know how to care and love the land in the way that it care and loves us and I'm really happy to hear that that's been the that has been happening in Hawaii and I'm, I'm for me I I don't necessarily see that happening where I'm from in the southwest um and and I I see a lot of tribes who want to engage in that genuine relationship um, with those entities. And unfortunately, those entities still hold very discriminatory practices and discriminatory views and assumptions about native and indigenous peoples. And so I'm wondering how how do you how do you like how can we change that culture within those within those systems, within like US Forest Service, within BLM? to get them to a space where, where we're able to build trust with them too, so that we're able to engage in the, in the care um, of our homelands. Krishna, I don't know if you have thoughts about this, um, but I know for, I know for, for, I can only speak to Hawaii and, and, and the time that I've been in conservation, I know, um, I think for me, I've I've been fortunate to be to come into conservation in my career at a time where these sorts of movements, um, that you know they've been up and running. Like people before me have been helping to push um, for transformation in in conservation in Hawaii, and so I I guess I haven't really had to. Um, for me, I think I came into it where it started to become a norm for for agency um, to start asking these kinds of questions and participating in these types of discussions. But I I have heard stories from you know like even just like uh, you know fifteen years ago that that wasn't how conservation was, and so um, you know just in that very short time of me come me starting my career at the Forest Service, like just several years before that. That's not how it was. Um, and not to say that I came in at a time where it was like, it was all great, you know, and everybody's hunky dory with each other. Like I have seen uh, and heard and experienced, um, you know, like the devaluing of indigenous knowledge and, um, and perspective in conservation in science and research. And so it's not that it's completely gone, um, but I, I think I was able to come in at a time where transformation was starting to happen. And so for me, I feel very, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, I don't know how, like, to, how to get those things started other than uh, coming from, I guess, like the, the schools and the communities that I, I were a part of that were trying to make these, tra these changes in, um, you know, systems, um, just, finding finding those allies um you know finding finding your village and just keep trying you know making your voices heard um asking the right questions and and sort of yeah th those kinds of things um i think for working at the forest service uh i like having christian as an ally has just made things easier. And so if Christian had not been there, would I have been, would I even be at the Forest Service? I would say no, probably not. Would the Forest Service look like it is today? I don't know. I would not think so because I think, I, I'm pretty sure I was one of the first Native Hawaiian Forest Service staff to be hired in Hilo. And so, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really loaded question. Um, but just continuing knowing, like, I guess, staying anchored in that, you know, that this is what's needed. It's what's gonna help benefit, not just the, the your, your indigenous community and your indigenous spaces, but um, that it would benefit, you know, everybody. 
native or not native, you know, agencies and, and everything like that. And so finding, finding people, yeah, finding those people who are at least willing to engage in the discussion. And, you know, one thing Kekuhi teaches us um, that, like, I, I, I think may apply to you is you, you make the invitation, you ask the questions, the people that need to, um, that are ready and open to hearing those questions and engaging in those discussions will come to the table when they're ready. So when we started Hala Uhi'a, um, you know, we started with maybe like 40, 40 50 people. Um, and who the, and you know, for me, when, when we were sending the invites out and like I saw who was signing up, I was like, how come they didn't sign up? Like, they gotta come, these people need it. You know, like, why aren't they coming? Like Kiku, he would always say, like, don't worry about that. Like, whoever is going to come right now, like, it's their time to come. We just continue doing what we're going to do. People are going to see what it is we're doing um, over time. And, you know, like, their connection to our ka'al, their connection to our story is going gonna, is gonna to shift and change the more, you know, we sort of get our work out there and help, you know, things become more visible. And so uh, I would say people you've had conversations or tried to have conversations with in the past, don't write them off because maybe it just wasn't time. They weren't mature in their, their thinking or their connection to your ka'al, to your story. You know, continue to invite, continue to ask, continue to try and sit at the table with them. Because, um, you know, who knows, something will trigger them to be like, you know, their hua, their hua is not yet realized and maybe they're not yet ready for their ha'alele, but, you know, got to trust that it will come one day and just keep trying. Um, thank you so much. And um, since you offered a prayer, I just want to offer one too um, for you and for um, for the great work that you're doing. Um, and uh that, that was part of what I've been offering since engaging in conversation with you and sharing space here. Um, and yeah, really, really grateful for you. Thank you for feeding me. Hello. Yeah, we got a question here, Ty. Yeah, thank you both. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I just have, since you're both actors within the Forest Service, I'm just kind of curious what you see as kind of the big, if there's a couple, if there's any big institutional barriers you see within the Forest Service to engaging in this type of your work that just kind of sticks out? Yeah, I guess I would uh, want to clarify that um, Kainana is completely for real. I'm the only actor <laughs> in this pair. Um, there are a lot of barriers. Um, I mean, 10 years ago when Kainana first uh, you know, started working with me at the Forest Service. Um, uh, I'm sure she was frustrated and saw me as a barrier, and it took a fair bit of training um, to help me sort of broaden my perspectives and see things in these multiple ways, to understand this collective memory idea even. Um, that these landscapes that she lived on had a different collective memory than the landscapes that I lived on, even though they were the same landscape. So there's that kind of education barrier. Normalizing conversations about this, um, I think has been a big barrier. So people don't know how to react um, when you start talking about uh, historical facts. It's not like it's, you know, anything um, uh, completely unreasonable. These are documented in books and all kinds of peer reviewed uh, literature, but it's just uncomfortable because it triggers a lot of complex legal, emotional issues. And because the conversations aren't normalized, um, people don't have the skill sets I found to understand how to engage. And I think what Kainana shared in her response um, 
you know, people may not be ready yet. Their hua is still um, maturing. Um, some of the bigger barriers are that we're a huge organization and people have hugely different collective memories of what's going on. And you can go to the Arapaho uh, National Forest, Roosevelt National Forest, Pawnee Grassland website, and there's complete erasure of indigenous people. History of those places started after conquest. Um, and you can go to almost any national forest website and, and you don't see anything about the history of those places that you know, preceded conquest. Um, that's a barrier. People are not necessarily um, wanting to engage that history um, for a lot of reasons. We know, um, you know, critical race theory right now is really getting um, a lot of pushback in places, even legislated pushback in places like Florida. And so it's not an easy um, topic because the Forest Service is a full spectrum of uh, you know, represents a full spectrum of people in this country. Um, so like any process, it's, it's going to be a longer conversation. Um, so barriers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one reason why I'm really excited about this, um, I was encouraged uh, to minimize graphs to not even maybe use graphs in this talk. And so I was like, okay, Kainana, uh, let's do it. And, um, and so this is our attempt to normalize this conversation outside of Hawaii. Yeah. I Good question. Is the Forest Service listening to your group and studying it and other agencies? So I, I want to say that, um, and I should have probably mentioned this after Kainana responded, um, and mahalo to um, Ariel for that question. Um, I, in 20 something years with the Forest Service, have never seen the national level interest in commitment to justice, equity, diversion, uh, diversity, inclusion um, issues. There are working groups now trying to understand um, uh, across. Um, uh, in an intersectionality kind of way, racial issues, gender issues, class issues, indigenous issues. There are um, some important firsts that have happened. Um, Secretary of Department of Interior, our new um, uh, Office of Tribal Relations lead um, is a very uh, radical, uh, radical in the sense that Forest Service tends to hire pretty conservative people who you know, um, follow a certain conventional uh, way of thinking. Um, you know, we're trained to go out and do certain things. And I was right there in this conventional way of looking at the world. And uh, on like day two, he said, all na national forests are indigenous lands. And he's making a very strong um, effort to normalize some of these conversations. So, uh, in addition to everything that Kainana said, Ariel, I think that um, you know there are some really exciting steps that I haven't seen before last year. Um, I don't know. Well, thank you, and thank you all for staying. I, I kind of feel like I want to let these folks kind of go and all that, but um, hopefully, this, I mean, this is a great uh, seminar and you're going to stay a little while longer uh, up here so if you want to engage in a more personal conversation kainana nice to meet you mahalo thank you for thanks for staying everybody